Now, would you give up a six-figure salary to become a teacher? Well, when new figures suggest thousands are leaving the profession because they're overloaded with work, one man who used to work in the city gave up brokering million-pound deals and decided to teach instead. Uh, not just that, but Moss and Ismail didn't go to some posh school. He went home to East London and Newham. He's head teacher and the school is one of the best in the country, with many of his students tipped to go to Oxford and Cambridge this year. He's here with me now. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, Moss has also teaching me how to tweet as well. <laughs> I don't think I've done a very good job of it. but I think you do very well. Yeah. Um, good to have you here with us. And, you know, I, I think I think the first sort of opinion people have is not not everyone would give up a good salary to go off and, and work in an inner city school. So what, what motivated you? I think for me, it was my experience that working in these city firms, uh, I didn't see too many people like me. And what I meant by that was... From a similar social background, uh, parents who are sort of migrants into this country who wanted to do well for themselves and their and their kids, but didn't really appreciate or have an understanding of what it actually takes to to get to this uh, place. And I think I was quite lucky that I managed to get to a a firm like Norton Rose Fulbright. Mm. Uh, But my my parents really valued education. And for me, it was about coming back to the neighbourhood that I grew up in. So, you know, born in Newham and I currently live in Ilford. because I always thought there were so many talented young people, but I didn't think that the schools that existed, or especially when I was growing up in the 1990s in secondary school, did a job that allowed you to access some of these professions. So it's fine that you can get fantastic GCSE results, fantastic A-level results, but there is this, almost this sort of hidden social um, code that exists in these firms that unless you're taught about it, then you can come unstuck. Yeah. Uh, but it's also about pushing students further as well. So, you know, we had the first student in Yum to ever go to MIT, you know, the best university in in the world for physics and engineering. And I remember standing in assemblies and speaking to young people when we were trying to recruit kids in 2014. And I would say to them, there's no reason why you can't become the prime minister of the country, no reason why you can't go to an Ivy League university, no reason why you can't go to Oxbridge. And you just look at their faces and there was almost actually, it's not realistic for them to do that. That's what they believed. But they, was it a case of they've never had anyone before say that to them? Yeah, I, I, I think that's part of it. Um, you know, you go to Eton or Harrow and you say that. Well, they're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, I probably will become the yeah. Prime Minister of the country because I look no around yeah. I look around, and I see so many uh, pictures of uh, former Prime Ministers. And I think it, for us, it was about trying to break that pernicious link between disadvantaged demographics and destination. And I always felt that there was, you know, New might be a poverty-stricken borough, but there wasn't a poverty of ambition amongst the, the students that, um, that grew up there. So that's exactly what I did. I came back to the neighbourhood and I said, well, I actually believe that I can do this. And then we're seeing within three or four years time, obviously, with the support of uh, the partner schools, got some fantastic teachers, brilliant parents who support the school and students, that it's, it's, it is actually possible. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you have turned things around um, in the time that you've been there. You've, um, as you mentioned, you know, students are being accepted into top universities, also benefiting from really good work placements as well. And I, and I imagine that's where your contacts come in quite useful. See, that's the other thing. I remember sitting in sort of once I qualified uh, and I had to fill in application forms, go for interviews to get a vacation placement or just some work experience. And then some would turn up and have a conversation and they were there on a one week work placement because their parents was a client of one of the partners or, or the law firm. And that exists. Mm. And I don't have a, a, an issue with that. But one of the things that I wanted to make sure was that our students who didn't have those contacts or links could tap into the links that I'd managed to develop over my time at, in city law firms. And therefore we organise. So you're paying it forward. Yeah, really yeah, absolutely. You know, we organised a, a trip, all expenses trip to Abu Dhabi with one of the world's leading international law firms. We've got a work placement in New York with another city law firm. We guarantee all our medics work placements at London hospitals. So things that are, you know, young people from Newham, from disadvantaged backgrounds would find difficult to get, but it's absolutely imperative that they have on their CV. Uh, we facilitate and we provide that for them. Did you have to build trust with the the, the children? You know, as someone who who went into this role, uh, what? How did you go about trying to inspire or, or get the children on side? Well, I think it, I think it's a story that resonates with young people. They want to enter professions similar to the ones that I worked in, and what better story than to say, well, I was born in Newham, no no different to you. I still live in the area. Um, these are the things you need to be doing to make sure you access some of these professions and I'm going to help you do that. Um, 
And that's exactly what's happened. So I, I don't think there's been a lack of aspiration from our kids. You're sort of living proof, aren't you, that you can you can make it, if, you know, to people from, from Newham who are, aren't quite sure what their future is. They well, can look at you. Well, it's, it's, it's an easier... It's an easy message to sell, I guess, mm. because you can, you know, stand up in assemblies and and actually say, "Look, I'm coming back to the neighbourhood that I grew up in. It's fine you having fantastic A level results, but that's not enough. So you need to have the social and cultural capital that would really allow you to compete with the uh, most able school uh, kids who are in the private education sector." And for me, that's still the issue. I still think A-levels and GCSEs are a poor barometer for educational attainment if you're comparing yourself to some of the best kids in private schools. Mm. You know, we went to City of London girls and the level of questioning, the level of confidence that these young girls had was fantastic. But on paper, they'll probably be no different to some of the students that are in, in our school. Yeah. So it's about teaching them not just the academics, but the things that go around about how to articulate themselves. Social skills, life it's, skills. It's, it's yeah. massive. The grades get you to a point, but then it's the social skills that you need. It's interesting. At school, I was never ta- taught about, and this is in the dark ages, <laughs> I'm joking, um, about how to do interviews yeah. or how to present yourself. Yeah. You know, and, and those are, in, in addition to all the subjects that you teach, those are the, the, the things that I imagine the children find very valuable. It, well, that, that's crucial, you know. Ultimately, you have to get the grades. That's the first and foremost. Yeah. So we're constantly focusing on that with outstanding learning and teaching and the opportunities. But then there's the whole thing about etiquettes and polish. You know, we're, we're, we're creating a curriculum which uh, looks at how we support students in very basic things like how do you compose an email to somebody that you've met? And that's, unless, you, un, unless, you've, unless you've been taught that, some of the emails that students send to us as teachers are shocking not because they're being rude just they just don't know how to compose one or when you walk into a room you know go and introduce yourself don't just go and sit in the back it's very basic things that people who are born into say middle class or educated families do routinely because their parents will be telling them this throughout their um, upbringing whereas mm. it might not be part of the culture or it might not necessarily be part of their upbringing um, until they get to us and in terms of the, you know, going in and 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 trying to turn things around, did you get much opposition, or were you well supported in in what you envisioned for the the school? Well, look, I think, you know, raising aspirations and uh, talking the language of sending students to Oxbridge and MIT and Ivy League is always going to be well received. The yeah. the, the issue is how do you go about doing it? Yeah, uh, and I think that's going to be that's always going to be the hard part. Like I said, I'm lucky that I've managed to recruit some fantastic teachers. Um, we've got, I think, 12 or 13 teachers that are Oxbridge um, graduates or educated, which allows us to do the Oxbridge provision on a Friday. So, you know, our, our, our curriculum is collapsed on a Friday. So um, our Oxbridge um, tutors meet with students and they mimic Oxbridge trials tut- tutorials. And that's the other thing, you know, if, if you're in a state school, you may not get necessarily get that support or provision um, to really help students actually master the interview process. But more importantly, it's those, um, the inside information about colleges and applications. To give you an example, if you apply for medicine at Oxford, well, most people have got 11 A stars at GCSE when they apply. Most have got three A's or predicted three A stars at A level. So you're, to get an interview is going to be extremely difficult. Mm. If you get there, only 11% of the people that are actually get there will get an offer. Whereas if you apply for natural sciences or material sciences or earth sciences, the chance of you getting into Oxbridge is a lot higher. But our parents still see, OK, if I do this degree, what job do I get at the end yeah. of it? Rather than thinking, well, if you go to Oxbridge, the, the reality is that those companies are going to be knocking on your door, asking you to join them. So it's these, these certain things, I think the Sutton Trust in the um, report talks about having this infa- inside information about colleges, courses that can support students from disadvantaged backgrounds. It is fair to say, though, isn't it, that not Oxford and Cambridge isn't on everyone's radar and it's not something that anyone necessarily, not everyone necessarily aspires to go to. I mean, don't get me wrong, obviously they are the, the big universities, but for some education isn't, you know, the, the, the natural sort of destination. Some people aren't academically gifted, I guess. Is there that sort of support in place for, for those sort of students? Well, for us, um, we um, obviously select our students um, and they come to us with the view of um, uh, going on to university or competitive school leaver programmes. So I think that's another area which has expanded significantly over the last five or ten years. 
Um, you know, KPMG do a fantastic program, PwC. I know some law firms are offering apprenticeships as well. So I think it depends on obviously your talents and your interest. But, but my view would still be that education uh, or a university degree pays. Uh, the, the research shows that over your lifetime, on average, uh, a male graduate will earn £175,000, a female nearly a quarter of a million. And I would say it's probably close to a million if you're entering professions like law or banking. Uh, law, law, if you want to qualify, you're on £75,000 at the age of 23 years old, yeah. which is I guess, an enormous I guess, amount of money. I guess my point is, and you know, let's be honest with Asian families, not going to university is not an not option. Not an option. You have to go, but not everyone can go to Oxford and Cambridge, is yeah. my point. And all the other red brick universities, or even the newer universities, are still legit places to go. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think um, you're absolutely right. Not everyone can go to Oxford or Cambridge, but I think what's happened in the past is there hasn't been enough people saying, well, that should be your aim and ambition. And, and that's the, the issue. You know, Oxford complained that not enough students from disadvantaged backgrounds actually apply to them. And why is that? Because maybe teachers are saying, well, maybe it's not for you. Mm. or maybe your grade profile is not strong enough. And again, we know that disadvantaged students get predicted lower grades than their more advantaged peers. So I think we should constantly be saying to students, there's no reason why you can't apply to Oxford and Cambridge or Ivy League universities, but absolutely all the other fantastic universities around London and across the country are also um, brilliant, which will allow you to get fantastic jobs at the end of it. I have a lot of friends who are teachers and they do they do moan about the profession and say it's a really thankless job, it's uh, hard work. And then I have lots of friends who aren't teachers who say that, that teachers have the best job and that they have too many holidays and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, I would like to know your viewpoint as someone who went into teaching. Yeah. What is teaching like? Well, for me, it's one of the most rewarding jobs that you can, you can do. You know, we have a, a moral imperative to support young people uh, and the prosperity of this country depends upon educating the next generation to the best of our abilities. I agree and there's been much written about the workload issue for teachers and it's incumbent upon senior leaders or head teachers like myself to make sure that we're having that dialogue to remove as much bureaucracy from teaching to allow teachers to do what they got into the profession for which is to share their subject knowledge and their passion for their subject to to young people mm. and we, we can all we all have stories of teachers that inspired us in particular subjects um, and, and I think that should be the focus the other issue is we don't have enough high quality graduates entering the profession and that's a, it's important that we uh, try to encourage as many of them into the classroom uh, teach first to a fantastic job there and I know there's lots of other initiatives but unless we can get um, high qualified graduates into the classroom, then the the level of learning and teaching will be limited to what it is at the moment. Why isn't that happening then? Well, I, I think there are several reasons. Number one, workload. Um, yeah. Secondly, pay. Uh, when, you know, when you look at the uh, the salaries of teachers, there's, I think I saw a stat which said that teachers are now 14% worse off in terms of their salary in real terms since 2010. So I think it's a combination of different things that puts off teachers from uh, from people from joining the profession. Hmm. And it's important that we need to constantly talk up the profession and talk about the, the benefits of being a teacher, the joy that you get from supporting young people, um, but also the, uh, the difference that you make to your, to your community and, your, and, your, um, and society as a whole. I've got this uh, message here from Anita, who's uh, saying, so pleased to hear your guest. As a mum, former lawyer and now coach, I go into school at times to work on CVs and interviews. Children are not taught to think to be themselves, develop resilience unless they get into trouble. Schools lack time and awareness. I'm desperate to help pupils and families in schools to raise self-awareness and confidence. And that's essentially what you're doing. Nice message from Anita. Well, absolutely. And I think I think this is the advantage that I've had. I've seen the other side of where the kids want to go to. And I've, and I'm, I've got exactly the same background as the kids. And as I said, the issues are not just making sure that the students re- achieve fantastic A-levels, but it's all this stuff about resilience, etiquettes, polish, soft skills, CV writing, networking, all of these things that are not taught at school, which are as important if not more, once you get into the, yeah. into those professions. What did mum and dad think of your 
your career change. <laughs> well, mum and dad were very pleased initially because I became a banking and finance lawyer in the city um, and they could parade me around Oh, everywhere. completely. <laughs> Show you off to the family, to the neighbours, yeah. Um, but um, obviously once I decided that I no longer wanted to be a lawyer, initially it was a, a frosty relationship, but um, my parents were extremely supportive. You know, they've always encouraged us to um, do what we uh, love and, you know, seeing the success that the school has had and the impact within the community, they couldn't be prouder. But also, you've you've been you've featured a lot in the media over you know what what you've achieved and uh, the fact that so many of your students are now going into top places. So they must look at that and think, okay, fine, he's done well. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. That's fine. If now I've, he's become successful in this, that's okay. I think if I failed, it might have been a different story. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've had um, you know, in terms of the success or success stories, you've ha- you've had a lot. Have there been any cases where it has been hard? And there are students who. Um, you know, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of like the Dangerous Minds film, you know, the that, that famous film where you do have students that maybe don't believe in themselves or it is a struggle that, you know, I can't imagine it's, it's just easy doing this job. No, it's not easy. I think, you know, relationships with young people is crucial. Hmm. Um, one of the... Uh, I th- one of the strengths I think of the sixth form is that I have an open door policy. Uh, I'm not a kind of principal that sits behind their desk um, pushing paper. One of the joys of teaching is that the interaction with young people, having those conversations, uh, finding out what their aspirations are and trying to f- support them in every partic- every way that I possibly can. So, you know, myself, my uh, senior leadership, te- leadership team, also the, my t- uh, teachers are constantly having those conversations. But at the same time, you know, we, we expect and we demand the highest standards in everything that they do. And the fact that they come from the second most deprived borough in London, uh, for me, it's uh, it makes no difference. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone's in a sixth form uniform. I expect everyone to have their top buttons done up and their shirts tucked in um, to present themselves in a, in a way which... I know in a professional way, which I know that if they don't, if we don't build these habits now, it would be detrimental to them when they go into these professions. So it's all about ensuring the highest expectations in everything that they do. And, you know, picking up on what you were saying before about the importance of teaching, for me, I remember my teachers more than I remember the subjects. And actually, my love for the subjects came because of yeah. the teachers. So I imagine that's something that, that you're really conscious of. Yeah, well, look... Um, like I said at the start, all of us know or remember teachers that inspired us. Uh, and either we went on to study that subject at a higher level or... Even if you didn't like it, necessarily. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> but I think if you had a great teacher, you end up enjoying it because it you worked hard at it and yeah. you became good at it. I think people really underestimate how important teachers can be to... to a, and it can go either way. If it's an awful teacher, it st- stays with you. But if they're a good teacher, it yeah. really moulds yeah. their mind. And that's why I said it's crucial that we continue to recruit some of the you know the best uh, graduates into the teaching profession so that they can have this impact. We know the greatest impact on attainment and outcomes is what goes on in the classroom. And, you know, when you strip away everything else, ultimately that's what it's about. It's about the relationship with those kids in that classroom a passion for that subject knowledge with high quality learning and teaching which delivers those results. And you've been nominated for an award as well so mum and dad must be even happier. <laughs> They're like, well, he's been nominated for an award, he's in the press, great. It's uh, it's a very prestigious award actually. It's the TES Further Education uh, Leader of the Year Award. Yes, I've uh, nominated and then shortlisted for the TES Further Education yeah. Leader of the Year Award which is obviously very extremely humbling. Um, but again, for me, you know, these kind of things or the success that the school has had, it's not a one-person job. It's a, it's a, it's a team of, of people who have bought into the vision of inspiring young people to do what inspires them and ensuring you know, um, they have a, an impact in society. Uh, and collectively, we've managed yeah. to do that. So hopefully, if I do win, it will, be, um, it, it will be recognition for all the hard work that the teachers have put in over the last three or four years. But also, I guess, it's a recognition of the style of of the style of teaching and uh, everything you're, you know, you've been telling me about about introducing new skills for, for students. It, it's saying, well, this works. You know, this is something that, that actually could inspire other schools as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the success we've had is you could um, somewhat say that you, we could model some of it. Uh, I think the advantage we have as a sixth form is we don't have key stage three or key stage four students. So our teachers are given a lot more time 
we can think creatively about how we uh, ensure that students are given the social and cultural capital. For example, every Friday students are taken out to London to go and see places of interest. Mm. Um, you know, very basic, simple things of that nature, things that I didn't really have growing up. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't given to me either in half-term holidays because my parents didn't have the time to take me or didn't just have an awareness of it. So the, the school ultimately becomes a surrogate parent. So we're constantly asking ourselves, you know, as middle class parents who are educated, what would you give your child to, to ensure that they would have the best chance of success in whatever they wanted to do? Um, and then we try to provide as much of that as we possibly yeah. can. I've just got this one more message uh, from Lou who says if teachers were allowed to get on and teach then there wouldn't be this huge shortage of good teachers entering the profession most of the paperwork is totally pointless doesn't benefit the pupil all it does is cause stress and illness there is a lot of paperwork involved though isn't there I think this is the other thing you know again being being uh, in, in a profession where it's profit motivated you're constantly asking what's the bottom line you get to think about is anything superfluous to what we're doing mm. and sometimes in teaching you can get into a a rut where you're doing the same initiatives over and over again. Teachers' time is being used, but no one really assessing whether, what's the impact of this? So that the other thing we're constantly asking, um, is this initiative that we're asking teachers to do, number one, is, you know, is it going to actually have the impact that we want it to have? And secondly, is there an easy way of doing it so it doesn't take up more teacher time? Yeah. And it's absolutely right. The most important thing is teachers in the classroom sharing their strong subject knowledge with students um, and doing it with passion. I wish I could come to your school. <laughs> I bet I could learn loads. Um, it's so lovely having you here. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. For inviting me in. um, that's uh, Mohsen Ismail there, the headmaster of Newham Collegiate Sixth Form in East London.